Support us by subscribing, ring the bell, thumbs up and watch the ads. Thanks to your support we can dedicate more time to videos, thank you. This video is dedicated to Robert Howden, Border Patrol agent who lost his life in the line of duty in 2019. Rest in peace, please listen carefully to the video speaker, he will give you statistics of 2019 and he will talk about the border wall and more. Good morning. Thank you all for uh, being here today to discuss CBP's Southwest Border Enforcement Statistics for September. But before I get to the numbers, I'd like to say thank you to the men and women of the Customs and Border Protection for their tireless efforts through fiscal year 2019 dealing with this unprecedented crisis. They do a phenomenal job securing our nation's borders, enforcing our nation's laws, saving lives, and maintaining the integrity of our system and rule of law, and doing so with humanity and compassion. Make no mistake, this country is safer because of their efforts, their sacrifices, and their dedication. This past Sunday, we lost another Border Patrol agent, Robert Houghton. In the line of duty while he was patrolling in the Tucson sector, he marks the 129th Border Patrol agent who has died in the line of duty. He leaves behind a wife and a son. His dedication, his life to public service, to protecting this great nation, I can promise you this, he will be missed but never forgotten. Now, as we've been expressing for some time now, this past fiscal year, CBP has faced unprecedented and staggering levels of illegal crossings. While the comprehensive numbers will be forthcoming with respect to all the numbers and all the statistics for 2019, CBP's enforcement actions on a southwest border totaled nearly 1 million in fiscal year 2019. This is a staggering 88% higher than the number of enforcement actions in 2018, 88% higher. These numbers are numbers that no immigration system in the world is designed to handle, including ours. Arrivals from families to the border in fiscal year 2019 more than tripled any uh, uh, previous fiscal year on record. Our Border Patrol facilities, we've talked about this, were not designed uh, to, to hold families or children. They were designed as police stations. And because of that, because of the new demographic of families and children, those resources became strained and our limited resources had to be diverted from their law enforcement duties securing the border to address the humanitarian crisis. Make no mistake, our country was less safe because of it. And what continued to drive and pull Central American families to our borders was the public knowledge that the United States immigration laws are filled with loopholes, often judicially created. The hundreds of thousands of families and children were told, coached, and made to believe if you make it to the United States border with a child, it was your passport into the interior United States. The cartels, smuggling organizations, on an almost daily basis would broadcast that they could guarantee their entry. All you had to do was pay. All while they exploited our laws and the migrants themselves. The cartels and smuggling organizations abused them and treated them with nothing more than as a commodity. This is what we wanted to stop. We have therefore prioritized developing strategies and introducing initiatives within the current legal framework that ensured results restored the rule of law and closed the loopholes that undermine the integrity of our immigration system. And this administration's strategies have brought about results, dramatic results. While Congress has failed to put forth a single piece of legislation, even be able to introduce it to the floor to address this crisis, we have addressed this crisis. This September marked the lowest number of law enforcement uh, actions during fiscal year 2019. The total number of law enforcement actions last month was just over 52,000, down almost 65% from the peak in May of 144,000. This represents the fourth month in a row of a steady decline in apprehensions. This is an unprecedented achievement. Last month, it was a de another decline of 18% from August to September, and this marked the fourth consecutive month that the United States Border Patrol alone averaged 25% lower in the last four months. 
and why have we achieved these significant results? Make no mistake as well, President Trump has worked to have other countries in the regions like Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries to join us as true partners, to come together to address this as a regional crisis that it is. And that's exactly what is happening. Initiatives uh, implemented under this administration, like the uh, Migrant Protection Protocol, or MPP, which was established in, accord in accordance with Section 235 of the Immigration and Nationality Act, have brought about the downward trend in border enforcement statistics and strengthened the integrity of the immigration system. In close partnership with the government of Mexico, MPP allows for migrants illegally crossing or at the POEs without documents to be returned to Mexico to await expedited immigration proceedings in the United States. If they have meritorious claims, they, re they receive relief in just a, a few months rather than waiting in limbo in the United States, sometimes for years. And if they have unsuccessful claims, they are swiftly returned to their home country or they can return voluntarily. Through our partnership with Mexico, CBP has enrolled more than 51,000 people in MPP. And Mexico, again, being true partners, has agreed to provide humanitarian protections and even work authorizations to these individuals for the duration of their stay. With MPP, migrants are receiving due process and protection while the United States is restoring integrity to our immigration system. We're closing the loopholes and diminishing the smuggling organization's ability to profit on the back of these migrants while simultaneously exploiting our system. Through this and other initiatives, CBP is continuing to collaborate with our foreign partners, particularly Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to address this as a regional crisis, as I said, specifically targeting gangs, human smuggling organizations, and the movement of illicit drugs. And while the Northern Triangle countries are stepping up to address the regional crisis, expanding their asylum capabilities, and expediting the return of citizens who do not qualify for asylum in the United States, Mexico's efforts are leading the way. Mexico's continued support of MPP and enhanced border security efforts along their southern border, in the interior, and along the U.S.-Mexico border is something really for the history books. The partnership between Mexico and the United States concerning this regional crisis is having a dramatic impact. The administration, we continue to enact a network of policies and regulations and initiatives, all within the current legal framework. Unfortunately, as we discussed before, judicial activism by lower courts continuously enjoins these attempts to address the crisis. The asylum IFR, for example, that requires migrants in the United States along the southwest border to seek asylum in a third country is governed by current law, yet it was enjoined by a lower court, and it took the Supreme Court just recently to overrule that lower court. And I'm here to tell you today we are instituting that asylum IFR this week. The Flores Regulation is another example, which allows DHS to enforce immigration laws passed by Congress to detain families with dignity and respect during the duration of the immigration proceedings. It's actually part of the floor Settlement Agreement, the law. But what happened when we tried to introduce that regulation? It was also stopped. So despite these obstacles and Congress's inaction, the administration efforts, they're working. I'll give you an example. Just four short uh, uh, months ago, our daily apprehensions were close to 5,000. And today, I just looked at it on my screen before I left my office, it's below 1,700. We went from over 19,000 people in custody just four short months ago to less than 4,000. We have essentially ended catch and release. If you come to our borders now with a child, it's no longer an immediate passport into the interior of the United States. Instead, they will be forwarded a lawful and expedited process, but they will not be released into the interior United States, never to be heard from again. While this demonstrates an incredible effort, especially by the men and women of CBP, there is more to do. 1,700 daily apprehensions, as I mentioned, is still unacceptable. The former secretary of DHS, Jay Johnson, he's been said uh, several times that when he was secretary, a bad day was 1,000 apprehensions. I agree with him 100%. And let's keep in mind, although we apprehended almost a thousand, uh, almost a million, excuse me, a million individuals this year, fiscal year 19, 
we, we, we estimate, and this is a conservative estimate, that there's probably around 150,000 individuals who eluded apprehension. That's nearly 13,000 each month. The bottom line, we still need Congress to pass meaningful legislation to address our broken legal framework when it comes to immigration. And while Congress has failed to bring a single piece of meaningful legislation to the floor, this president, this administration is doing exactly what he promised the American people. Now let me move on to something else, the wall. Having served as chief of the Border Patrol in 2016, I proudly support the need and importance of the wall. CBP, with the help of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, is continuing to pride, provide the men and women of CBP what they have asked for to do the job of protecting this great nation on the front lines. To date, a total of 71 miles of new wall has already been constructed. And it's not just a wall, it's a wall system, integrating lighting, technology, and access roads. This wall system is essential to our nation's border security by replacing outdated and dilapidated designs and construction of a much needed physical barrier in strategic locations as requested by the leaders in the field. This isn't what the president asked for. This is what the experts asked for, to help them do their job to safeguard and protect this great nation. The president has simply listened to them and he's delivering his promise. By the end of 2020, CBP expects to have approximately 450 miles of new border wall system constructed. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, walls work. Our agents know it and the data shows it. Everywhere we have installed borders along the southwest border, agents gain more operational control, illegal drug and human smuggling activity declines, agent safety improves, and border communities are safer and more secure on both sides of the border. And the wall just doesn't benefit border communities. By the way of illustration, in a five-day enforcement action that ended last Wednesday, United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement arrested 97 illegal aliens in six Midwest states. That's important, including those with prior criminal histories, conviction for serious crimes, assault, uh, a battery, child exploitation, sexual assault, drug possession, hit and run, and weapons offenses. And again, this was in six states in the Midwest. This underscores the reality that some of the illegal aliens who cross at the southwest border make their way into the nation's interior and commit serious crimes. If we're going to have a rational and intellectually and honest debate over this issue, we must acknowledge the public safety issues imposed by some, not all, but some illegal aliens. The wall serves to impede and increase our ability to apprehend criminal illegal aliens before they make it into the interior of the United States. That is the truth. The wall also increases our ability to stem the flow of illicit narcotics into our country. Last year, we lost 68,000 people to drug overdoses. The year before that, we lost 70,000 people due to drug overdoses. And last year, CBP seized more than 910,000 kilograms of illicit narcotics. 910,000. As an example, the majority of heroin for, uh, uh, comes from our southwest border, making its way to your town, your city, and your state. So this further illustrates what goes on at the border impacts every community. And the wall gives CBP the opportunity to more effectively detect and prevent drugs from entering our country and killing our citizens. That's why I always say every town, every city, every state is a border town, border city, and border state. Now let me close by pointing out a, a, a couple other additional compliments of CBP agents and officers. Every day they answer the call, putting their lives on the line to protect this nation. And this just isn't a tagline. Over 30 years of law enforcement experience, this agency is something, and they do something that, that I've never seen before. In fiscal year 2019, United States Border Patrol agents rescued more than 4,900 people along the southwest border. Let that soak in a minute. They rescued 4,900 individuals along the southwest border. In the midst of this crisis, our agents rendered aid and in many cases put themselves in harm's way to rescue thousands of people whose lives are well being at risk. When agents see a migrant family struggling in a river, they've answered the call. 
When they locate people dying of thirst in the desert, they answer the call. When our agents and officers see somebody in need, they don't ask them questions about their citizenship or their migration status. They see a human being in need and they answer the call. And they've done so 4,900 times this year. These incredible stories play out just about every day along our border and they deserve our attention. These stories and, and, and these stories that the American people deserve to know through the news media. I think now we have time for a, a few questions. Thank you. So, yes, ma'am. They are talking to migrants, doctors, shelter directors, who say MPP, in essence, the U.S. government is creating violent and dangerous situations that they are trying to escape from their home countries. What is your response to that? And what are you doing to address this violence? So Mexico is doing a, a very similar um, activities that, that we are doing here. So here, our, our system was overwhelmed. I think everybody understands that. Again, back in May, 144,000. Uh, we relied on NGOs and faith-based organizations. That's one example that the government of Mexico is doing. The same similar process that we did. So they're, they're relying on NGOs and faith-based organizations to help them with the individuals that are going over there, including MPP. In addition to that, the UN, is, is there actively in the northern border of Mexico uh, helping them uh, address and deal with the individuals uh, that are uh, enrolled in MPP. The, um, the International Organization for Migration, for example, is actually there assisting uh, through the UN and assisting the government of Mexico. They're actually providing free service for people that are in enrolled in MPP to actually return to their home country if they feel unsafe or they're just getting tired of wait because the majority of them know they're economic migrants and they're not going to qualify for asylum. And now that the message is getting out that we are, through this administration efforts, we're closing those loopholes. And so now the message is finally getting out. We're trying to overcome the message that the cartels have been putting out there that it's going to be a free ride into the United States. We're now sending the message that if you're coming here as an economic migrant, you're not going to be allowed in the United States. That's driving a lot of people to so return. In other words, the U.S. Yes, is, not, in other words, the US is not doing I, anything I, I, to I work with I answer your question. Mexico. Yes, sir. You didn't, you, sir. Yes, sir. If I Go could, I, let me follow up actually on what she was asking you about. Is there operational and financial collaboration with the Mexicans? Uh, the president and you have also been very complimentary about what they're doing. So I'm just curious, what's the level of that involvement? And is what we're doing making a difference to try to keep those people safe as they try to make their journey to this country and or in, a, in Mexico. For Absolutely. We're, we're dealing with the government of Mexico at high levels almost a daily basis and a local level, which really a lot of times that's where it happens. I just returned from uh, RGV again, where I talked to our local leadership and they expressed to me the, the great collaborative work and relationship they have with the government of Mexico. For example, I'll give you an example. So MPP Times. We're working with the government of Mexico to make sure that their capacity to receive people is just that, that they have the capacity to receive them uh, so that they're not overwhelmed. We're talking about the times and the durations of when we're actually going to return them to Mexico, uh, whether it's uh, uh, hours early in the morning or at night. We're working with them on a constant basis. Um, again, another important thing that we're working with them, too, is is it's not, it's bigger than just MPP. So we're working with them to address the drug smuggling routes and the drug uh, smuggling organization. We're working with them on a daily basis to help them improve their uh, ability to actually conduct operations within Mexico to go after the cartels and the drug smuggling organizations and the gang members. And we're doing the same thing with the Northern Triangle countries. I think everybody here knows by now, uh, all three Northern Triangle countries have signed uh, agreements right now. And we're, and like I said in my, in my opening remarks, we're working with those countries on a daily basis. I have personnel that are down in the Northern Triangle countries to help them improve their capacity, not just with their law enforcement activities, but also their asylum capabilities as well. a lot of money in terms of paying for Mexico's participation and providing security along the border. Are I, we as Americans helping to pay for that? I, I think what we're doing is we're being good, true partners as they are in dealing with this as a regional crisis. We all have responsibilities as a part of this. They're, they're helping us. Think about this. They've got 25,000 troops that are now dedicated to this. They've uh, 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 an enormous amount of troops to their southern border, interior enforcement, and, the, uh, and at their U.S.-Mexico border. Every, every law enforcement action that they take, that helps our country. 
Right now, they've almost doubled their southern border apprehensions. That helps this country. The fact that they've received 50,000 individuals through MPP, that's a great cost and expense to them. They're helping us, and we help them. So, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, while you're up here, I wanted to ask you about a number of incidents over the past year of CBP agents uh, harassing journalists on their way into the country from overseas assignments. Uh, can you say right now that that, that conduct is unacceptable and can you say uh, what you're doing about it to stop this from happening? So a couple of things. First of all, unequivocally, let me say that any journalist, right, that is stopped and harassed, uh, uh, um, treated improperly because they're a journalist is absolutely unacceptable, unequivocally. And, and so what, what we do, and I, I read a recent article about that, and when that happens, a, a couple of things can happen. Uh, if you feel that, that you have been inappropriately uh, handled, uh, harassed, then you need to report that immediately, right? And there's a couple different avenues. You can report it directly to CBP, our uh, uh, Office of Professional Responsibility, DHSIG, and I encourage you to do that. If you feel that you've been inappropriately harassed, you need to do that. We proactively, if we see something in an article, even if it hasn't been reported, we're gonna report it to our Office of Professional Responsibility. Because here's one thing we can say. We can disagree all we want, right? I learned from Lieutenant uh, uh, General O'Lear a long time ago, disrespect doesn't mean disagreement. Right? And there's a little thing in the country called freedom of speech. So anything that we do that would impede that, we are going to hold people accountable. It's unacceptable, 100%. Yes, ma'am. A couple questions. One, do you know how many kids are currently being held at the border of that 4,000 number you cited? So I don't know that specifically, but we can get you those numbers. We, we, we keep track of that. And just to follow up more broadly, the Northern Triangle countries, Mexico, what is the administration doing to address the root causes of the problem? the violence, um, the poverty. I, I hear you talking about troops and the reinforcements that have been sent in, but is the U.S. actually sending in resources that can help stem the flow of those core issues? So I think that's spot on. That's a great question because we, we can address uh, the loopholes on our system, those, those pull factors, all we want. But until we also help those countries address the push factors, we're only going to be half there. So we are. And, and again, a couple examples. Right now, besides the, the, the agreements that have been signed by all three countries, uh, and again, Look, th that's not just about the asylum part of that. Those agreements really go to the heart of, of addressing this as true partners as a regional crisis to do just what you hit. You were spot on to, to uh, increase their capacity, right, to go after the smuggling organizations, to increase their capacity to go after the, 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 the gang members, to stop that violence. So that's one thing that we're absolutely helping. Another thing we're trying to do is is help build their capacity, their asylum capacity as well. Uh, so we're, we're doing those type of things every single day with those Northern Triangle countries to help them build. Because at the end of the day, look, look Border Patrol agents will tell you, they've talked to these individuals. They, they, they want to stay in their home country, right? I, I mean, that, that's their home. And it, it, look, I've talked to all three ministers of security for the Northern Triangle countries, and they said to me, um, it, it wasn't just to me, to, to a group of, of U.S. officials, they said, you know, America, please change your laws, fix your loopholes, because you're taking our kids, for example. They said, you're taking our vitality. You're taking the youth of our country. We want our kids back. Fix your laws. Work with us, and we'll work with you to stem the flow of those of our children leaving our country. Uh, so we recognize that, and we are trying to help them. So, yes, sir. Given the decline that you've mentioned in border apprehensions that you've seen over the course of the past few months, and also the cooperation that you've mentioned that uh, you're receiving from Mexico, is a safe third country agreement with Mexico even necessary? So I, I can tell you right now, what, what the dialogues that, that we're having with Mexico is, what they're doing right now is incredible. Um, so uh, we, we're going to continue to have dialogues to con continue to improve anywhere that we can uh, with, between our partnership and, and, again, to to really look at this as a regional crisis. But right now, we're just focusing on the, the incredible effort that's going on right now. They, they are, uh, Mexico, absolutely, again, and I mean this, it, this really is, the cooperation and partnership we have with Mexico right now really is one for the history books. Mexico, it really is. Minister says that such an agreement is not necessary because of the, the numbers that you've also cited. Um, do you disagree with the foreign minister? No, I don't. R right now, the, the cooperation, I mean, it's a good question. Right now, the cooperation that we are receiving with Mexico right now, it, it is, is exactly where we need it to be. I'll give you an example. Just last week was the first time 
um, OTMs other than Mexicans. This is the first time that the government of Mexico actually apprehended more OTMs than the Border Patrol did. The first time since we started keeping those stats. Uh, that, I think, illustrates the incredible uh, work that they're doing. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Morgan. And talking about how long Mexico can sustain this, you very complimentary about what they're doing right now, but the last time you were here, you were very skeptical about how long they could keep this up. So feasibly, how long can they keep this level of productivity and helping the U.S. with the war crisis? So I think, honestly, as a law enforcement uh, individual for a long time, <clears throat> you know, I, I think part of what makes us okay at our jobs is that we always maintain a healthy degree of skepticism. But I can tell you, 30 days is a long time in this crisis. What, what Mexico has shown me is they're sustaining this. Uh, their capacity is growing. Uh, on, on all those fronts, their, their interior enforcement, their, their enforcement of the southern border, as well as their continued expansion of MPP and the support of that. Having said that, what, what I feel, though, is, is even though they're being incredible partners, for a durable, lasting solution, we cannot rely on other countries to fix the loopholes in our system. They're being great partners, but at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. It's Congress's responsibility. As this administration, this president, is, is coming up with these new initiatives and regs and policies, and even though judicial activism is trying to enjoin those and put up obstacles, at the end of the day, Congress's failure to act is the issue. So to have a durable, meaningful solution with respect to this crisis, Congress has got to get off the bench, work on a bipartisan matter to pass meaningful legislation to address this crisis. I've said that, and I'm going to keep saying that. So, yes, sir. You were very effusive in your praise of the Port of Patrol and on the ground. And when I went to the border this spring, they were thankful for that, but thought it was a bit hollow because they say their pay scale and their overtime pay policy is hampering their efforts. They would like to see a change in the overtime pay policy. They would like to see greater numbers, more boots on the ground, and they hold you responsible for that. Could you address that issue? And then if the numbers are down, why do you need a wall if they're saying they need more people? So what I would say is, first and foremost, I am absolutely responsible, first and foremost, and I take on that responsibility. It's something that we always struggle. I think every federal agency is always struggling with pay reform, uh, overtime, more personnel. I don't think you're going to meet a, a chief of police or sheriff or agency head and federal agency that will ever say that, that we're okay, we don't need more people. Uh, so we do need more people. Uh, we're constantly looking at innovative ways uh, to, to increase pay, uh, whether it's overtime or, or retention bonuses, to keep the talented workforce we have. It's a continuing struggle. It's something I'm dedicated to, absolutely. And as far as the, the number of people, what I would say is the wall, uh, again, I say it's a wall system as part of a multi-layered strategy. So you need the infrastructure, the technology, uh, the infrastructure of the wall, along with technology and personnel. What, what happens is if you apply all three of those in, in the right way in the strategic location, it'll actually reduce the number of personnel that you need in that area so we can focus them to the more strategic locations. So it's a balance of, of both of that. So with, with every mile of wall that, that goes up, it increases our capability to do their so job. Will you commit to greater pay or at least clearing up the disparity between customs and uh, ICE and Border Patrolmen because when I was down there, that was the, that was their number one issue. They want they like the job that they're doing, but they want you guys to at least give them equal pay, that they're not getting paid equally to ICE and customs. So first of all, um, I hear the same thing, uh, but first and foremost, you know what I hear first and foremost? What makes me proud to be a part of this and be standing next to them is they are proud to represent this country. They are proud to be on the front lines safeguarding our nation's borders. That's what they're proud of. And, and as the agency head, I should try to do everything I can to, to make sure that they're being paid and taken care of adequately. So I, I commit to that. Yes, absolutely, I commit to that. So, yes, ma'am. Sorry about the CBP agents that are doing credible fear screenings. Could you give us sort of an update on how many are doing it, at what ports of entry, what is the goal of the number as you scale up, uh, and when you would like to have it scaled up? So uh, th there's there's a, a few things to unpack there. So so what we have done, and again, this is to augment uh, USCIS asylum officers because I think everybody knows here is, is there's just not a, enough asylum officers. So what we've actually done is, is trained a handful. I don't have the exact numbers to date now. I can get those for you. But um, we're, we're continuing that program, and we're going to continue to expand that program to support USCIS. And right now, it, it's it's being successful. Uh, we, we've been able to, as part of our expedited process that we're doing, uh, the, uh, the uh, temporary uh, hearing facilities that are down there, uh, those agents are helping as well to facilitate that expedited process. 
the, the program is working well. I, I'm taking a hard look at expanding that program uh, because, again, USCIS plays an integral role in this process through the asylum officers. So that, that's kind of a bottleneck. If we don't have that capacity there, it's going to limit our ability to effectively expedite the process. Question, so, question, so, so yes, sir. Is there a target number that you can reach uh, to say that the surge, essentially, of people coming across the border is over? And also, how are you counting those people who are stopped under remain in Mexico? So those, those are really, really good questions. Um, I've thought about that a lot. I, I, you know, a couple times I, I, you know, I've said, hey, I'd, I'd like to have the apprehensions under 500 a day. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just me kind of throwing something out there at a manageable level, looking at what the historic uh, lows are. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, standing here as the commissioner of CBP, I'd like the number to be zero, but that's not realistic. Um, so I, I, I think, again, Jay Johnson, uh, I'll bring that up again, he said 1,000 was a bad day. So, you know, if we could start getting that down uh, to the 500 range, uh, don't hold me to that. that. That's just a little bit of, you know, uns unscientific uh, you know, uh, guessing, guesstimation that I'm putting out there. But, you know, that, that becomes manageable. I, I think what's also important, though, and the reason why I hesitate to say, you know, hold fast on a specific number like 500 is the demographic these days are very different. So if it was 500 Mexican adult males, that's very different for us. But when you're talking about their families and unaccompanied kids, that brings on a whole new dynamic. And that's one of the challenges for us. So 500 Mexican adult males is different than, you know, 350 families and kids and